can keep the questions coming, people. Feel free to keep them ticking over. OK, thank you, Thomas. Hi, everyone. And yes, my screen is online. Good evening from Europe. And uh, thank you very much for having me. I would like to talk about warning response from an emergency service perspective. And please keep in mind the German context of these presentations. Uh, maybe we can discuss transferability to other regions, other countries later. Um, yes, let's see about that. Um, let me start with the answer to a question we asked emergency managers in a 2014 survey about a hypothetical forecast probability at which they would start with preparatory action. And as you can see here, 55% of the emergency managers would only start taking action if a forecasted severe weather event would exceed 70% probability of occurrence. So why do emergency managers do not want to act at an earlier stage of time when the probability of an event is still low? And although we can, could think, um, this is the assumption of by some researchers and national weather services, that a gain in lead time enhances preparedness and the adequate allocation of response, uh, resources. So this kind of results um, require a deeper look into the interpretations actually of uncertainty, what we saw in Susan talks already, and the actions taken by the warning recipients. And that's what I will show you in a uh, couple of minutes. So um, first of all, preparatory measures are main prepared to respond. And the aim is to ensure and maintain the organization's ability to act. So they allow the organization to respond to an event and most measures are therefore taken to avoid any surprises and disruptions of the workflow. And once those organizations get the uh, weather warning or forecast, um, they start with observation of the weather, including consultation of the weather services, maybe the regional offices via telephone and ask for more detailed information. And this is therefore one of the main issues which follow up a severe weather warning. Some warning recipients act as gateway to other institutions and they simply forward warnings internally or to subordinated authorities. Especially command centers are a typical warning recipient that act only as gateway and it's not necessary the one to undertake measures on the ground. And we have always have to keep this in mind and we talk about oh, what are we doing? What is your response? What are you taking for measures? Other measures can be grouped into personal Personnel measures like extending the length of services, calling up of duty units, or the creation of management, uh, crisis management groups or emergency task forces. Or non personal preparatory measures, including the deployment or relocating of technical requirements, equipments, and vehicles. But during a uh, sense, a series of workshops together with representatives from different key organizations, mainly emergency management organizations, we derived a set of requirements that uh, those users ask for. First of all, as weather is not restricted to administrative, administrative, administrative borders, emergency managers have a strong request that their warnings, that warnings recognize their spatial and temporal needs. Some experienced users, such as firefighters, who receive weather warnings daily, prefer an intensification of warnings, meaning warning level and the time between the information when the evening the, the event is nearing. Meaning they want to receive a notification with low probability and subsequent information with higher probability and more detailed weather information later. Additionally, emergency managers working mostly during or right after a severe weather event started um, they state that uh, weather information about the current intensity and the expected end of the event are vital to and could help structure their operational practices right as the event happens. Precis precision in space is slightly favored over lead time by emergency services, water management and other users. But for instance, road maintenance prefer earliness to precision. Especially when warnings indicate just low probability of occurrence and are forwarded internally through the emergency management chain, emergency managers are cautious as they, expected, as they expect that their staff 
pay less attention to warnings in general when they receive them too often. So what we mostly know under the term of uh, cry wolf effect. As a lot of emergency services in Germany and worldwide rely on volunteers, emergency services also fear loss in the employer's willingness to excuse the employees for voluntary services during working hours if warnings become more frequent in general without having visible impact in the respective area. They assume that people need to be able to verify warnings for themselves to a certain degree in order to keep believing the warning information they are given. On the other hand, some firefighters made interesting comparisons to fire detection systems. And here you can see one of the quotes from our surveys. Um, it is common practice to respond to a fire detection system within the, within the necessary uh, power of force as if there is a fire, although in many cases detection systems give false alarms. The consequences of not responding to alarm will be too costly. And this attitude is comparable to the treatment of weather warnings and exceptional cases may lead to a very preemptive approach to deal with uncertainty. For most emergency managers, relevant information is information on impacts. That, they, that can be expected, especially if the organization does not have the capabilities to derive a potential impact from their own statistical models or past experiences. As they are mostly reactive in coping with severe weather events, the impacts are of more concern to the emergency managers than the weather event itself. Or as you can see here in the words of firefighters, the impact is not the precipitation itself, but flooded basements, overflown streets that cause the disruption to the organizational routines. Emergency managers told us that detailed information must be, must be accessible and suitable for everyone within their organization, and any hierarchy and knowledge levels between the users should be avoided. And at last, technical requirements are numerous ICT related issues that I don't get into further detail here. But to sum it up, it's more about the failure, failure resistance, redundancy, and fallback solutions. So, how can weather warnings cover the various emergency managers' needs? Um, one way to aid users to better conceive weather warnings is by providing impact information like traffic disruptions, fire missions, and others, and compare them with similar events from the near past. It can be linked with probabilities of past and current weather events, resulting in some kind of local impact climatology. And I just want to point out one of the various points uh, which are um, currently discussed under the term impact information. And this is that some emergency managers formulate their concerns about how to handle conflicting information from officially and non-official sources, which they worried could lead to a problem of operational decision making, as reliability of sources is hard to assess quickly right during an event. So they often prefer their own staff on the ground to act as information source on local impacts. The second point I want to raise is cooperation. Um, emergency managers see the personal contact to a regional weather advisor with local experience as very helpful for their decision making to explain forecast uncertainties and dissolve misunderstandings. And there are several good examples around the world on cooperation and I um, skip that. But let me pick here just one other point of discussion. And this is that if we take cooperation seriously, then the receiver's role and uh, would shift from pure user to partner and collaborator and with all the rights and obligations that will follow from that. And maybe we can discuss this later. So to sum up, um, be transparent and open about the uncertainty in weather what information. Communicate the consequences of weather. Establish good collaborations between the forecaster and key users that helps to understand mutual needs and enhances trust. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer some of the questions. Back to you, Sally. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, so we have a question here from Dave. 
Is it concerning to weather officers at all to have emergency managers provide weather briefings to their colleagues or others? Do you find that some impacts or specifics might be misinterpreted? Mm. Uh. So that the impacts are missable, I have to think a little bit about this question. Um, so I guess it's mm -hmm. if emergency managers were to communicate their own weather information or have discussions amongst themselves, is that concerning for the meteorologists or forecasts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a hard question. It's like it's the question who is who's the who's the leader in a discussion, right? It's like um, who is who is who is who's the one to say the the final word. And I think um, one thing to keep in mind is that people always talk about weather. <laughs> and so uh, not only the official information of the source that uh, they receive, but uh, people who watch out the window, they go to work, they experience weather, and they have a kind of feeling what is going on. So, and they will talk about it. So, and they might have already um, experienced the impact of weather on, weather on their way to work. Um, but this all has a has definitely has a um, some some impact on on decision making. Mm, can that be a conflict? Yeah, could be. It could be. It's difficult to answer. I have to think about it. Mm. I suspect people's tacit knowledge and and yeah, their own experiences probably influence their decisions quite a lot, as you say. Okay. Next question is from Beth Ebert in Australia. In Germany, do emergency managers and weather forecasters sometimes work as a team, i.e. in the same room? No, not, not that often. Um, so not during routine situations. Um, um, there are situations, um, for example, um, when you have a specific outdoor event, like let's say a, a huge festival, music festival, where um, the organizer might um, have a meteorologist on board. Um, mainly coming from private companies. Um, but um, emergency managers are one of the prior customers to, to, to the weather service, so they always can call them and ask for, for more, more advice. Um, and there are, we have, in Germany, we have uh, different regional offices um, and they are responsible for uh, one or more um, of the federal states. And so during, during the daytime, they always can call them and ask for, for further advice and that's um, what we have experienced during our studies um, that they do it and they ask for, let's say, mainly it's about the, as I said, about the, the current ongoing event or about the end of the event. So, for example, if let's say there is a, a winter storm coming up and it's snowing and um, it's um, 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the evening, and um, so the, one of the um, firefighter forces are going are going home. They uh, the next shift uh, will start, and now one of the commanding firefighters might be interested in, no, in no, knowing when will the event stop. Will it continue to snow during the whole night? And especially, what's about the next morning? Six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. All people going to work. There will be more traffic. There might be some some accidents, and this is when I need my people to be on board. So I don't want to have them all out now and then I have to send them home because they're tired. And then in the next morning, all of, uh, every, everyone wakes up, sees the snow and um, there might be some impacts. So this is um, very crucial to their to their decision making. And that's one of the uh, yeah, typical situations where they might um, take the telephone and ask a meteorologist for help. Mm. I think that partnerships between the um, the different organisations involved is really a, a crucial discussion when you're t talking about trust and uncertainty and that sort of thing. We've got a question here from Diana. Um, what issues in terms of organisational differences and requirements, cultures, etc., do you see that need to be overcome to facilitate effective communication and coordination between forecasters and end users? That's a very good question. Um, so. We've looked into different um, organizational practices and uh, specifica, and one is lead time, definitely. So there's the firefighter. They are always um, ready to work. That's that's in their habit. So they're sitting in their in their cars, in the trucks at the fire station, and then they get alarm and then they get out and respond to it. 
And then there are, um, let's say, a crisis communication uh, coordination groups or task force. They need several hours to, to group together and um, maybe even longer. And so there's um, really a huge difference on, on what kind of organization you're talking about. So that's one of the issues, so that's lead time. The other one is, um, there can be several, that's um, you have kind of organizational cultures, so how people um, really uh, want to work or um, what they think, how they can handle situations. So for example, um, we looked into volunteer firefighters and they, we had situations where they were actually um, a little bit upset that nothing happens. So because they are they are they signed up for being voluntary firefighters, then there is an event coming and they say, yeah, I can I can help, I can I can I can I can work, I can uh, dig some some snow or cut some trees or whatever, and then nothing happens, and then they are really upset because they have to go home and nothing was was going on. So it's um, maybe strange for 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 people thinking about that, but it could, it's some of the within the the culture of firefighting. It's it's more about really like going out there and working. Um, so that's that's one of the issues as well. Do you think that those emergency responders going out like that? Would they want much detail on the forecast or do they like as in detail about uncertainty or do they just want to get the headline risk? Do you think it's a question from Linda? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So um, uh, it depends uh, as always. Um, so we, we've seen um, a lot of firefighters who don't want to receive that kind of information. They say if there is an alarm, I go out with full force of power and I, I don't care how 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 uncertain the information is or not, because if I don't go there, then it would be my failure. It would be my uh, my mistake. So I go there and nothing happens for me. That's fine. And so going back to Susan's presentation, for example, they don't have this kind of um, cost loss ratio. They don't they don't think in 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 in, in uh, and monetary values. They just think from, for instance, in um, uh, saved lives, for example, or even political reputation. So it's very important to go out there and help. But then there are others who think about this and might, maybe they have uh, less resources available. Maybe they have to um, think about um, um, shortage in, in their staff or something like this or um, in, in, in equipment. And they they definitely think about okay let's let's see okay how 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 certain are you with this information and how far can I go not to respond to this or that and yeah maybe the last thing is very important it's always about this responding and this maybe relates to the to the question before as well is that um, from my understanding is that the culture of firefighting is very um, is responding is responding to an event. And this is not really, really proactive. And um, we, we can see some changes there, but um, other uh, but other places we can't see them. So that's really an, an, an issue um, which might change with um, new ICT and um, models available for them, for their decision making. But um, deep down, they are very, um, they're responding to events and they're not proactive. OK, cool. Um, I'm going to change tack a little bit now. Um, I've got a question from Armel. How does the German Met Service, WDWD, manage to predict impacts per se? Do you have an impacts database continually updated and referred to in an analog way for future events resembling previous impactful ones? Great That's question. a very good question. Um, I think I'm not the, the, the best to answer that because I'm not from the, from the German Weather Service. Um, for as far as I understand, there's um, no such database available at the moment, and it's a big question. And it's a lot about privacy issues. It's a lot about uh, where to store, who has access to it. And there's research, and I presented uh, two examples um, on my slides uh, about, um, for example, um, traffic incidents um, at um, FU Berlin. Um, colleagues there working on, on this issue. And there's research, research, for example, on um, impacts on, on fire brigade missions. So um, how many um, weather related um, fire brigade missions are there um, with respect to, to um, certain events? So there are, there are the, the data is available somewhere. So someone has made a, a record, someone has written it down, 
but it's not available um, publicly, obviously, but it's not available for the um, German weather service either. Uh, because it's either a local community data or it um, belongs to the state or to another authority. And so there's work on it, how, if it makes sense to use it, but it's, at the moment it's not operational. That sounds pretty similar to, um, in my experience, to many countries around the world starting to gather that impact information, but perhaps it's not quite in a robust usable database as yet. And that's going to be quite important when it comes to issuing impact based warnings as advocated for by the World Meteorological Organization. So I, I've seen in quite a few papers how there's a, a bit of a call for those impact databases to be um, really built up and, and ready to go to be able to issue those impact based warnings in future. OK, thank you, Thomas. There are a few more questions that I'll publish and put into the Q&A function if you if you want to try and um, reply to those directly. Sure. Otherwise, for timing, we're going to move on to Amisha now. Um, so I shall 